Welcome, everybody. We have, I think, a very interesting and wonderful panel tonight to discuss a complex topic, which is accountability in global health. Accountability is an interesting word, which our panelists will perhaps define for us in their own terms. But this is a sense of going beyond a question of might we have shared goals for global health, might we all have some responsibility for global health versus the question of what entities, what institutions, what people can actually be called to account, uh, so held responsible at some higher level for the different complex aspects of global health. Let me introduce our panelists uh, first uh, just by name and then I'll read to you uh, very briefly some highlights of their biographies. To my left is Gru Harlem Brundtland, who is the former Director General of the World Health Organization, former Prime Minister of Norway, and Chair of the United Nations Commission on Environment and Development. To her left is David Brown, who is a journalist at the Washington Post, and then Patty Stonecipher, who is co-chair and president of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and then Suet Weibull-Prolpressert, and I won't attempt to pronounce your last name a second time, <laughs> Suet, and I'm sorry if I mangled it. Uh, uh, it sounds like I didn't quite win the free dinner in Thailand <laughs> for that attempt. Um, you can try. That can attempt. Try. <laughs> who's the Deputy Permanent Secretary at the Ministry of Health in Thailand and Vice Chair of the Board of the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria. Let me just say a little bit <coughs> more, just for a minute, about our panelists. Um, Gru Harlem Brunt Brundtland uh, is the former Director General of the World Health Organization. Currently, uh, she is at the Health, uh, Health Policy Forum Fellow at the Kennedy School's Malcolm Wiener Center for Social Policy. Uh, Dr. Brundtland served as General Director of WHO from 1998 to 2003 after serving as the first woman Prime Minister of Norway, a post that she held for more than 10 years. Dr. Brundtland, who has also served as Environmental Minister and a Member of Parliament from Oslo, is also a physician, having received her MD from Oslo University and a Master's of Public Health from the Harvard School of Public Health so we like to claim her as our own. Uh, it's perhaps not yeah, entirely fair, exactly. but we're quite proud. In 1965, uh, she has had an enormous number of well-deserved honors, which I will uh, not embarrass her by reading to you now. David Brown has been a journalist with the Washington Post, reporting on issues related to science and medicine since 1991. During that time, he has contributed to the newspaper's coverage of such subjects as changes in clinical medicine, the emergence of evidence-based medicine paradigms, and the prevention of medical error, a very hot topic currently uh, in the United States. He's also written on several global health issues, including AIDS, polio eradication, something that was in the news today, micronutrient supplementation, and influenza surveillance. Next. Um, Patty Stonecipher is co-chair and president of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and she leads its efforts to improve equity in global health and learning. The Seattle-based foundation has an endowment of approximately $26 billion. Patty Stonecipher oversees the foundation's four programs, global health, education, libraries, and the Pacific Northwest. I guess you have to do something for the area that you <laughs> find yourself in. The Foundation's Global Health Program is focused on accelerating the development and deployment of health interventions to save lives and reduce the burden of disease in developing countries. Its education program works to ensure that all students have access to a quality education. The library program recently completed a $250 million commitment to address the digital divide, partnering with libraries to bring internet access to low-income communities throughout the United States. The program is now focused on helping those libraries stay connected and on expanding internet access to selected communities around the world. There's an inter interesting potential interaction between that kind of project 
and our desire to put educational material on the web uh, where it would be accessible uh, not only in the United States but to the developing world. Suet is the Deputy Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Public Health Thailand and Vice Chair of the Board of the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis and Malaria. Between 1985 and 88, he joined the Central Health Planning Division in the Thai Ministry of Public Health as head of the Monitoring Evaluation Section and head of the Budgeting Section. He became the director of the Northeastern Public Health College between 1988 and 1991. Between then and 1993, he became the director of the technical division of the Thai equivalent of the Food and Drug Administration. After that, he was the director of the Bureau of Health Policy and Plan, chief medical officer and assistant permanent secretary, and director of the International Health Policy Program in Thailand. These are just short biographies, but as you can see, we have very eminent guests. And without further ado, what I'm going to do is just turn to each of the panelists and ask them to give from their point of view, uh, given the institutions <coughs> they're either now associated with or have been recently associated with, their view of this concept of accountability for global health. And then we'll open it up to perhaps questions from each other uh, and then questions from the floor. Uh, Prime Minister Brundtland, would you tell us a bit of your view of accountability, primarily from the point of view of our global agencies like the WHO? Well, you know, there I would kind of start from a very different perspective, frankly, because the accountability of one international agency is really a minute part of a very broad picture. So in a sense, I think global health is health in each nation, within each nation, and at the global level. And those who are responsible politically, and everyone who can act to support goals that are shared in a country, they should be part of the solution, but the government has to be responsible and accountable. However, it's not enough to be responsible for your own population. So you have agencies like the WHO, the United Nations, that have the Millennium Summit, have identified the goals, Millennium Development Goals. Many of them are health-related. Now how do they, and it's a contract between countries. Each country has to be accountable to pursue those goals. They have all signed up to it. But they, the, the countries that are rich are accountable to be part of supporting those countries that are poor to be able to do so. Because there is a global accountability question because we have defined certain goals which are common goals and then so each person has to vote, each person has to feel responsibility and accountability to the common good, I feel. You know, we all are in a way part of this solution. So as we are sitting here representing foundations, the press, uh, you know, uh, the service of an international institution and in my former life government, you know, uh, and, and uh, Suet uh, representing uh, in a, at least the Thai government at a certain level here, we are all accountable but we are all dependent on measuring where we are and where we are going. Because unless you can monitor and evaluate what's happening, how can you measure whether we pursue our goals in an effective way? So those are some of the questions on my mind. And WHO, of course, is a specialized agency that has to help support countries and support the global community to be able to measure the evidence base so that we can be accountable and move effectively forward. So I think we, we will come back to this, but I think this idea of actually gathering data, of g gathering real evidence, and of some level of transparency about that evidence is absolutely critical if anybody is to be held accountable for performance. Yeah. Okay. Let me now uh, turn to uh, Mr. Brown. You want to talk about the role of the press and its, uh, how, how the press might be accountable in this area of global health and how the press also holds people accountable 
in the area of global health. I mean, it's two distinct issues. One is being accountable for sort of accuracy and the degree to which the press might share good information as opposed to propagate rumors and bad information. Uh, and then the degree to which the press has a role in holding governments, agencies, and so forth accountable. Well, I, I think that uh, the notion that something is to be, um, a role is to be expected um, uh, of the press it, it is itself a, a notion that much of the press would, um, would resist. Uh, the press is reluctant to have um, assigned it even unofficially uh, a role as part of a system of accountability in matters of health system performance, uh, either uh, nationally or globally. Uh, and it resists the notion uh, that it is somehow a tool and in, an in, in instrument to some uh, greater good or, or some, some, something larger than itself whose goals and principles uh, were created by by some, some other, by some decision makers or some decisions that it did not participate in. Uh, the U.S. media uh, do not view equity or quality of health care, especially outside of the U.S., as something that it has a historical or cultural responsibility uh, to watch or to promote. Uh, there's actually very few things that, that it does have such a, uh, uh, a, a expectation both uh, inside the profession and in the part of the public to watch and uh, hold to accounts and that's uh, really limited to um, openness in government, uh, equal treatment of citizens and to some extent um, the question of prudent use of taxpayers' dollars. Um, the, 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 the sort of permanent responsibilities of the press as an account keeper uh, are, are fairly narrowly defined and much of them actually derive from uh, interpretations of the, uh, uh, of the First Amendment. That said, the, the media, or more precisely some media outlets and some reporters <clears throat> may pick up on their own the idea that they have some responsibility to report on inequalities of health care outcomes and access, issues of variations of quality of treatment or the translation of knowledge into clinical practice. Uh, but that will largely reflect personal interest and the notions of, of professional responsibility, um, personal professional responsibility. And it will always have to be driven by the main exig exigencies of the news, which is uh, that, that the subjects be interesting, that they be new and novel in, in, in some way, by some definition, uh, that there be a human face and in many ways preferably a narrative, a human narrative, uh, and that they be fairly easily understood, that they be something that you can read and understand while you're sitting in a subway car or standing. Um, so I, I, I have some other things okay, to say, but, can, I, but that's, 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 interesting. that's the accountability. Yeah. Idea. Hey, we were talking before. I uh, had run a uh, public funding agency before I came back to Harvard, and we were held accountable by the Congress and by advocacy groups. But you're in an in interesting position in a private foundation uh, with, uh, with a private board. And I'm wondering how you develop a sense, or if you do, of accountability uh, for how you set your priorities. I mean, where do you, uh, where do you get the, the, the sense to uh, choose to fund one area versus another? And how do you decide you've done the right thing? Who are you accountable to? And also, conversely, do you have a role in making others accountable for global health? These are really important questions, obviously. The Gates Foundation is relatively young. Um, just seven years ago, really, the two pre-existing, and the Gates Foundation isn't even a nonprofit corporation, it's a trust. And so, uh, legally, we're responsible to the trustees and to the state because uh, the whole basis for philanthropy in the United States is that there's some level of tax preference to the dollars. So, in fact, the, the dollars are held 
uh, against uh, the public interests. Oh. And the requirement is that philanthropic dollars be spent for public good. Well, that's a really yeah. wide yeah, that's broad. Yeah. Uh, a spectrum on which to choose. Um, but the, the Gates family really took very seriously the adage that most of us learned at our <coughs> mother's or father's knees that to who much is given, much is expected. And they looked around and said, um, given the size of these resources, what are the biggest um, changes that we could make? And really felt strongly that um, some of the global inequities that are caused by what Bill describes as the random geography of birth uh, were uh, things that they wanted to address and <coughs> looked at this 21st century that we're in, the role of governments and the role of market and felt that there was a role for a philanthropic player to use their assets to really improve health equity and especially um, improve health in the developing world. The way we measure whether we're being effective in that or not is we start with effectiveness, which is to me the most important part of accountability. Effectiveness are against our mission. If we hear about inequity in health, then we should look at the highest burden of disease and the highest burdens that are not addressed, that are inequitable, that uh, the likelihood of having that disease if you're a poor person is much, much higher, and that the attention put against that disease is higher. So we actually have measures for those things and hold ourselves to um, funding, uh, the using the vast majority of our funds against um, efforts against those biggest inequities. Then you say, okay, so you decided on malaria, but all of the great things being done in malaria, how do you decide what to fund in that area? And then we do look at the accountability of the organizations, at the appropriateness of either the knowledge they're going to build that will help others spend money more wisely or hold others uh, to new standards of performance or create knowledge that's unavailable. <laughs> Or uh, we look at the product or intervention they're likely to build, the pursuit for a malaria vaccine, the efforts for better malaria drugs, and try to determine could those efforts, if <coughs> successful, be determinative? In other words, could they really have a high uh, likelihood of change to the inequity? And then is the organization itself accountable, reliable, likely to ask and, and pursue the right questions? and then are the systems in place to measure it. And so we do try to hold ourselves to a series of accountability measures because we do believe we have a public trust. And um, in spite of, of, uh, of your recognition that this is not one of the things the, the media automatically signs up for, thankfully the media in, in this country and really around the globe does hold philanthropic players to a level of accountability on whether it's the best uh, use of the funds. Your second part of the question, which is, and do we, are we able to use those funds also to hold others accountable? I think one of the hallmarks of the, of the Gates family is they're kind of math junkies. Yes. And uh, um, that, that helped them build a lot of good software, but it also um, has a tendency for um, the kinds of questions and the kinds of accountability we ask. And we do believe this is a field with too few uh, metrics, yes. too little evidence, too little reliability in the evidence that's there and some pretty big gaps in knowledge. And so we do use our monies and our grant making to ensure that people are asking hard questions and then building solid evidence. Um, but these are hard questions these are, to Well, get I evidence. noticed though that you and Dr. Brundtland in some sense really have focused a lot on making sure that we are measuring the right things and measuring them well. Uh, as a way of holding, whether it's a countries uh, from the point of view of the WHO or grantees or even yourselves to account, uh, and that you really want to do things, and this is reassuring, that are truly effective. You don't want to fool yourself. I think that's actually very important. Tragically, not a universal view. Um, and tragically, not always good at it, even yes. when we do have yeah. it as the view. So right. just seeking evidence doesn't mean you're going to get good evidence. No, no, and I think no. we've all found that sometimes just starting to collect the information leads you to the fact you're asking the wrong question. Absolutely. In some areas of medicine, we measure the wrong thing very, very well. Yes. Uh. <laughs> we, we funded some of that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Suet, do you want to give your view of, uh, from the point of view of uh, someone who's in the government, a lot of government experience in uh, Thailand, of what you, you would see from your perspective as 
uh, the accountability of, of governments. Well, uh, Steve, I need your advice first because my yes. past experience with uh, this kind of uh, discussion with, uh, in front of the camera is that I need to speak to the camera, not you. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Speak to uh, so the students. Am, am, am I right? I need to speak. Yes, you should speak to the <laughs> students. Very good. You're, you're giving I, I us listen, a little lesson on the way. But they're going to, uh, they're going to uh, <laughs> question you, so you might as well make eye contact Okay, now. okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Then, Form then, them up. then I understand <laughs> that uh, we are going to have an internet, you know, broadcast as well, so it's better to talk to the camera. Yes, right? exactly. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, I have a few points that I would like to share. First, there's no such word as accountability in my language. So my understanding is that accountability is a Western-oriented you know, term and concept. But it doesn't mean that we do not understand accountability, but we may understand accountability in a different way. So this is my first point. So whenever you, you listen to what I am saying, I may understand accountability is different from you. A second, in this complex world, it's very difficult to hold someone accountable for something. If you go into a country, a developing country, for example, in, in, in Africa, and you, you said, you know, you said to a health minister, you know, you, you haven't uh, worked very well because the immunization rate in your country is less than 50%. You must be accountable for that. Yes, I'm ready to be accountable for that. But please tell your, uh, the Western world that don't you know, uh, move uh, my nurses and doctors from my country. I'm losing 20, 30 nurses a month to your country. And how can I'm, I can be whole accountable for that? I have, not, I have no nurses to give immunization. And you come in and measure the immunization rate in my country and you say that I'm not, you know, I, I'm not responsible for that. Why you people are sucking my nurses and my doctor from me? And I have no means to protect that because I'm poor. And this is the second point. Third, you have to be very careful. If you go into a developing country and you ask uh, some powerful people for their accountability, you may lose your life. And, and that is true in, in many developing countries. And it, it is uh, something that uh, you have to be very, very careful. Uh, uh, even the, uh, the, uh, the less strong word like responsibility is already something very strong. So uh, um, um, my last point is that sometimes accountability is not enough. You have to go beyond that. If I'm accountable to have uh, uh, one doctor to go to every rural district in my country, it may not be enough because they are physically there, but they are not spiritually there. So maybe sometimes we have to move beyond accountability. Spiritual commitment. <coughs> this is a very interesting beginning, and uh, I've been reflecting on I mean, why this why this issue of accountability is so important. I mean, but it really gets to what are the forces uh, by which advocates for global health can hold somebody's feet to the fire to be more than responsible. Today on the front page uh, of the New York Times, it's a domestic issue, but uh, it was pointed out that uh, one of the pharmaceutical companies uh, raised the prices of an antiretroviral drug fourfold uh, partly, uh, they explained, because there are price controls in other countries, and uh, if they didn't make their profits here in the U.S., they couldn't reinvest in research. We, I, I don't want to argue about the, the merits of that, but, but it, it's a species of, th that was on the front page of the paper, and for some people, it would elicit moral outrage. Uh, what is the standing of that moral outrage? Does that hold people accountable? In democracies, do people vote their governments out? I mean, I mean and then the press, I think th there is some sense that you putting that on the front page might elicit uh, a certain kind of emotional reaction. I mean, why is news like that on the front page? In democracies, do we ever vote out officials uh, because of uh, inequities in global health or even in local health care? And even more complicated in the developing world, 
I mean, what, what is there really, is there really anything to hold people's feet to the fire? Does anyone want to pick up on any of those strands? David, do you want to? Well, I, 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 I think that the, um, th there, there is some um, uh, implied accountability when the New York Times, uh, you know, b behind the decision to put uh, a story like that on page one. Um, but in general, I, I, I think that for, for more sophisticated questions like <clears throat> is, a, uh, is a health system using its limited resources uh, to, uh, in, in the most efficient way, in the fairest way, um, is it choosing the right diseases to um, have as its, uh, as its highest priorities. Th this, this requires, to, for, for the press to, to address those issues and to look, look at subjects like that um, with any sophistication really requires not, not only the, the, the sense that, that, that the uh, bright light of, of the press can, can have a useful effect, but, but it requires a huge consciousness raising on, on the part of editors and reporters, mm -hmm. uh, um, just to begin with, there's very little um, uh, knowledge base uh, about the magnitude of global health problems. Most of the uh, um, uh, of the most important global health problems are problems that don't exist in the United States. David, let me let me. That's, that's sort of. Have you had trouble with editors? I mean, for SARS, everyone here. Uh, immediately had dark fantasies of a pandemic carrying us all away, and it became news. But for diseases like malaria or AIDS, do you have trouble getting editors to agree that these are important stories? Well, one, one of the very few good things about the AIDS uh, pandemic is that it has kept a global health story, a story in which mm -hmm. the disease um, uh, is, is having its greatest effect outside the United States on, on on page one and in the newspaper, and it has raised. It's taken a while, but but it it, it has raised uh, uh, issues of the responsibility of the West or the North, as it's now yes. uh, called preferentially, uh, um, to to the rest of the world. Um, but in 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 general, the the idea that one can systematically evaluate health systems, health interventions, um, the, is, 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 is an idea that, that most editors and, and many reporters don't understand. The whole sort of evidence-based paradigm is only, only beginning to, uh, uh, to sort of seep into mm -hmm. journalism. Much of journalism, uh, many of the stories that one reads uh, every day consist of, of rounding up opinions on mm -hmm. some event or on some phenomenon. And and, uh, and and put you know put right. cobbling them together, um, and the idea of of having um, of evaluating systems that are systematically evaluating human interventions and governmental interventions uh, requires people to realize that that such a world exists and such things are possible. Sure. You know, I have a, maybe I can rephrase this question. Uh, for you, one of the things, one of the hallmarks of uh, many positive hallmarks of your tenure as general director of the WHO was an attempt to find ways of holding countries <coughs> accountable in a way that they could uh, uh, see publicly. There were rankings. Um, uh, what, what is, in retrospect, looking back, did you think that the that what you did? began to have the desired effect, because I know you can't change the world overnight. What else would you do to try to engage the different kinds of countries? Uh, because Suet reminded us that uh, Western or Northern democracies might behave differently from some developing countries. Yeah, wh what, uh, what we saw when uh, we tried to measure the performance of health systems across the different countries and regions of the world was that some poor countries were happy to be able to prove that, in fact, although they were doing a reasonably good job, they had a low level of outcomes 
people could see the differences. Uh, and others were angry. Some rich countries were angry because they were measured and didn't come out the way they thought they should. <clears throat> some, some countries were angry because they were coming up too high because they, the health minister then lost the argument that he needed more support. Or, although we tried to measure uh, according to the level of resources available to the country, it, it was a complex measurement mm -hmm. method anyway. But we saw many different responses and the debates that came out of it led to a lot of increased awareness about accountability and about the need to have an evidence base and about the need for countries to share and to be able to have comparable measurements. So as we measure the Millennium Development Goals, which I uh, talked about in the beginning here, uh, which are many of them health-related, the targets and the uh, indicators, uh, the, the seriousness of one's own effort and efficiency or effectiveness and the request to others to be actively supporting becomes improved because you have data to discuss and you have measurements that can be uh, compared. This, I think it's essential. Uh, and um, I have no doubt that uh, as the world, world is moving forward, global health and development issues, because it's both. It's not two separate arenas completely, this, uh, are going to have to, you have to have universities interested, research, you know, and efforts made to help civil society and governments and people to be able to move forward on an evidence-based basis. I think this is important, and Harvard can make a difference in doing some of that work. Uh, and helping, having, um, but that then means that you have to have a broad aspect which is not too American focused. Because I think when, when David Brown is, is telling about how he experiences journalism, I'm sure many journalists around in other countries of the world would nod to many of the things you're saying. However, in the U.S. generally, there is less interest in global issues than in many other countries. Yeah. And that's a problem for the United States, yeah. as well as the world. So the fact that AIDS was able to be kept on the agenda for a certain amount of time at least, not always so high now, but the example you gave about the medicine price is another inspiration to raise again the debate about is this right or wrong, what should be done, and so it means that it's not forgotten, uh, and, and it's a very important development that this happens. But this is not AIDS, it's not the only issue, and I, as you said, it has l taught people a lot, I think, which helps them understand that the, the world has these great inequities, and is it necessary? Does it have to be like that? No. You just raise the interest in other countries and do more effort to change the poverty face of so many countries, you can make a major difference. And you can use health interventions as one way of improving the standards of life in other countries at relatively low cost, frankly. You know, at a lot of bright Harvard students here, and of course, this is a self-selected group. We didn't force them to come and listen to the <laughs> global health talk. But by and large, most Harvard students, most talented students, are going to focus on the domestic problems. I mean, that's where a lot of the rewards are. And, uh, and so it is. Uh, American companies uh, are, are, in the end, responsible to their shareholders. And uh, they're not charities, and they have to make profits. Um, uh, so we've used this tough word, accountability, but uh, what are even uh, the incentives? What are our... Uh, responsibilities. Patty, your foundation is using uh, funding uh, uh, as, a, as a way of drawing some of our best and brightest to focus not just on domestic health issues but on global issues. Um, but in your mind, does it go beyond that? I mean, do we just have to set a certain amount of incentives and hope that it works or is there some deeper responsibility? Is there some moral responsibility we have? Well, I think all of us start with 
a, a certain, you know, we're born with a certain amount of self-interest. It's a preservation attitude. And I would dare say that the tr strong interest in SARS was less about a pandemic than it was about a fear that it would end up in Cambridge. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, yeah. And um, that, in fact, um, bringing people into the awareness of their responsibility and the interconnectedness of some of these issues with their own uh, life. I mean, AIDS, at least in part, broke through because most of us knew someone who had been infected, who was positive, or who did struggle with this. And it, it helped us understand that this is everyone's challenge, and this is everyone's problem, whether that person is in Botswana or in Seattle. Um, you know, one in three people in this, on this globe have TB, latent TB, but TB. And yet, we don't hear, read, or talk much about TB. If one in three people in the, you know, people thought of that as a risk to them in the United States, where would it be in terms of the coverage in the, in the Washington Post? Um, but also, oh, you know, your presumption that the incentives are all um, askew. I mean, it's, it's partially, we are altruistic, but we have a tendency to shut down when we don't believe there's action that we can take. Mm -hmm. And I spoke to somebody mm -hmm. today that reviews admissions in the MPH program, and I may not, maybe I'm not supposed to share this number, but 60% of the people that apply say they want to work on global health. Mm -hmm. They want to work on these issues uh, because they believe at that moment they have power, they have potential, they have capability. Then they get out in the incentive ship because of jobs or, or student loans or any of mm -hmm. a hundred other things. Right. Mm -hmm. um, right. And, and opportunity changes. But I do, I think that one of the biggest reasons for accountability is that we are altruistic. We do want to make a difference, but we don't believe we can because there hasn't been sufficient evidence. I have sat in the last few months in a very powerful senator's office in Washington, D.C., and he echoed something that I have heard time and time again in the last three years, and he said, I'll stand up and ask for $2 billion. Just tell me it will work. Mm -hmm. Tell me we can spend it. Tell me we can absorb it. Tell me, whether it's the right word or the wrong word, that somebody will be accountable for using those dollars well, and I'll stand up and say, it's our responsibility, it's our job, and I believe my voters will support me if I can turn around and prove that those... So a huge part of this accountability is not to ensure that people didn't waste dollars, but so that we get lots more dollars. And we, mm -hmm. we need to ensure that everybody from multilaterals to individuals feel this is a worthwhile investment because they're going to spend their money on the local symphony or the local school because they feel like they know where that money goes and they're not spending the money on you know, this I because we haven't convinced them. I think you've said something very important for mm -hmm. our students. President Summers and I were actually discussing something uh, just a few nights ago about why there are so many people interested in global health. And it's not just because the university has a new global health initiative with a fine new director, Chris Murray, although I hope so. <laughs> it's partly because students think that at this time we can actually do something, that we can get traction. Yeah. And I, I, so I think it's very, very important. People are altruistic, but I think it is very important to, for people to feel their lives are going to be effective and they're not tilting at windmills. So I think that you've made a very, very important point. Let me, before turning to questions, can I ask you a completely unfair question, Sue, which is, and, and you can decline to answer, but from, uh, and I can't, and it's completely unfair to ask you to speak from the point of view of a developing country because, you know, you'll have a certain perspective, but do you, if you could generalize uh, from the point of view of uh, your, your, your views or Thailand or the developing world, do you think that the North has a responsibility in global health and do you think we're beginning to meet that responsibility or do you think that that is just not a question we can ask? Well, I think it's a fair question. When you still uh, give three billion dollars each year to subsidize your 25,000 cotton farmers, which make Million of cotton farmers in uh, Africa went into bankruptcy. When the, 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 the European Union still spent 1.2 billion dollar, uh, European dollar each year to subsidize the uh, sugar farmers, and even Finland grow sugar now because of this, <laughs> and, and make <laughs> and make all the poor sugar <laughs> the farmers in, in developing country become poorer. 
And how can you talk about your, your, your accountability on global health, you know? And this is something that you, you can talk a lot, but you, you, you are doing something much different, much different from what you should do. And this is something that uh, I was thrilled, you know, when, when uh, I, I start to learn that, oh, Harvard is interested in global health now. This is something like good news to me. And then one of, then one of my friends who know the U.S. business very well uh, told me that, so it, you have to be very careful. When some institute in, in the U.S. is interested in something, it means that that issue has a lot of money in it. <laughs> I hope, I hope uh, Harvard's interest in global health is, is in Harvard's spirit, not because Harvard feels that now you have a lot of donors uh, like Gates, you know, put a lot of money <laughs> <laughs> into global health, then Harvard jump in. You know. For me, as someone from developing country, Harvard is like a mecca. You know. Just the name of Harvard is you know, something that you cannot value. And this huge social capital can do a lot, can do a lot without a, a single dollar from, from Patty. Agreed. And Harvard must do something different, totally different from, from some simple thing that uh, other less famous university can do. I'm not going to tell you now what I think Harvard should do. You, know, you, you can tell you me ask. later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to uh, yeah. assure the audience that you told me that you actually really like me for my mind. Exactly. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, when I was, Patty, when I was running, it's, it's, it is so true. When I was running an NIH institute, I had 10,000 new friends. Oh, it's when amazing. I went to the neuroscience meetings, I was surrounded by my friends. And the day I resigned, I <laughs> probably as I changed my mouthwash, something went wrong. I, <laughs> good news I, is I had friends and family before I started this. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, we're uncontaminated friends. <laughs> um, to our panelists, we have an audience of uh, students, of faculty, of deans, of former deans, of our extended Harvard family. And so I would welcome now questions. Please come to the microphone <coughs> and... and uh, Please state your name and uh, in one sentence what school or program you're affiliated with. Uh, and please make sure your question is actually a question. Well, some say that what... Uh, what what's your name? Oh, my name. Yes, sorry, yes. I always forget that part. Yes. I'm Alexandra. I'm a, in the Masters of Public Policy program here first year. Um, there are many who say what gets measured is what gets noticed. And so I wondered if you could talk a little bit about how, what your experiences have been um, in setting what measurements that you're going to use for accountability and how that might affect the agenda of, of your programs. And as the vice chair was, was talking about, this accountability might not, not, might, might not be organic to um, the programs and the agenda of developing countries and of the programs there. So I wondered if you could speak a little bit about that. Anybody want to? Can I say one general thing is that when I came to WHO, I, I really uh, fully realized that we had been at the international level <coughs> developing the Human Development Index, which I saw was a very helpful instrument in order to have people realize what kinds of issues are at stake when you try to measure the standard of life, you know, in different countries around the world in, in a way that gradually, but not in the beginning, was acceptable to everybody. And it's used and it's very important, as you say, what you measure gets noticed. Uh, but there was a big scream for years about the way you calculate it, whether it was good or bad, and, and then, you know. But health was not as much part of that index as it should have been, because there was not sufficient health data to make that possible. So I thought there is not enough health data, although we have statistics about child mortality and maternal mortality, although much of it is not good enough. You know, in every country there are certain uh, areas of statistics, but we don't know enough to be able to compare. So I knew that this evidence base needed to be built up and that for politicians to start 
relating, and the press, to start relating to the health issues at the global and political level the way they do to education, for instance. Something had to happen to bring it up the agenda. And measurement is part of it. Next question. Yeah, um, I'm Joya Mukherjee. I'm the Medical Director of Partners in Health and I'm the faculty at the Division of Social Medicine Health Inequalities at the Brigham. Um, but my question is uh, about accountability and I, I loved very, I was the one clapping there in the front row when you talked about how poor countries are really suffering the, the external structures that are put on them from uh, wealthier countries. And I was wondering if from the perspective of the Global Fund or perhaps even the Gates Foundation, you have some perspective on how as a global community we can hold donor nations accountable for the kinds of policies that are put in place that are really hurting the health of, of poor people. Well, uh, first I would uh, uh, have to be, be, be clear with you that uh, my vice chairmanship of the Global Fund stopped since March 17. So I am more free now to speak uh, yeah. on, uh, uh, on behalf of myself. I can tell you that within the Global Fund itself, we have 22 board members, 4 non-voter and 18 voters, voting right, uh, member with voting rights. We do not have the same idea. You know. We have to work so hard to end up with some compromise agreement. Mm -hmm. And we design a voting system that it is very difficult to win a vote because you have 18 vote voters, uh, vote, uh, member with voting rights, nine from the south and nine from the north. If you are going to win, win the vote, you have to have two-third majority of both sides, yeah. of the north and of the, the south, north. you know. Yeah. And this is essentially almost impossible. And, and this is a good way, a good mechanism that uh, you have to work hard. So sometimes we meet until almost midnight before we, we are too tired to, qua to argue and then we agree on something. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there are many things that we, 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 we try, we try hard. And I can tell you that every country, south and north, come in with their self-interest. And in some country come in not with, with the government interest, but bring with them the interest of industry. And this is fact of life, you know. We are in the world that use the, the rule of jungle as the basic rule for, for survival. The, the example that Steve mentioned about the increasing in price four times, five times, this is the rule of jungle. The, the stronger, you know, get the most. The bigger fish eat the small fish. And that's the fact of life. And can, can you hold the, the the uh, rich government accountable in global fund? Can you hold uh, the developing country government accountable in the global fund? I think the NGO in the global fund is very strong. And global fund is one of, I have never seen in, any other uh, uh, with my limited, limited experience, that civil society participate in the governing body of a global health structure, big global health structure, not participated as an observer, but participated as a strong advocate and member with voting rights. And they are much stronger than government. And they are the one who help shape the agenda, who help, you know, uh, push big country not to go too much for their self-interest. And I think if we can broaden this participation to other global health initiatives and make, make the issue more public, I think the, this issue of four times in, increase in uh, an AIDS drug uh, in, the, in the media can become a hot issue for discussion and can expose the greed-based activities that people uh, that, that capitalist country are using, which I am not sh I'm sure that the world cannot go on this way. We have huge amount of, so, uh, of 
science and technology innovation, which get foundation support a lot. But why the world still have no peace? Why five billion people of the world still not uh, enjoy the, 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 the technology? Because we spend much less effort on social innovation. We spend too much, more than enough to send people to walk on the moon. But five billion people still <laughs> cannot, have, cannot enjoy a, a better life. This is something that we need to change. Okay. We're going to go around. You, you are next, and then up here, and then back to the next questioner. Um, I'm Tom Pyle. I'm the former head of Harvard Community Health Plan and uh, presently the uh, temporary acting director of medical education for South African blacks. Um, this is, I think, directed primarily at David and Patty. Um, there are two threads in accountability. One is access. Uh, the other is quality. There are several threads in quality, one of which is effectiveness. Another is freedom from medical error, which has been mentioned already. And the third is the effective use of resources or the non-squandering of resources. And as we look at the global issue, I would particularly ask the two of you, how do we get the United States to be more sharing both within our own country, where we have 44 million <coughs> people with no coverage, and also on a global basis, we, where we are spending huge amounts of money compared to what's available when I walk into a rural area in South Africa and see the kind of treatment that the people have there. David, you want to go first? Patty? Well, I, I, I think that um, the, the main thing that the press can do is uh, write stories about how people are dying or, or living at, at, uh, with poor health because of want of extremely um, low, uh, cheap interventions and, and have that just, you know, a, appeal to the native conscience of, uh, of the reader. The, 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 the problem is that, that there is health news, um, you in, in the American press, looked at in, in, the, in, in sort of the harshest light is, is, is not very different from narcissism. Uh, and and it, it is a, uh, the, the, there's an expectation that readers will get information that's useful to them and that this knocks all sorts of interesting and important news about people who aren't them and aren't the readers uh, off, off page one. The, the um, uh, just, uh, you know, an example fairly recently, the, um, in, uh, shortly before Christmas, um, the World Health Organization rolled out the, its, its plan for how it was going to um, attempt to bring antiretroviral treatment to three million people by 2005, the so-called three by five. Um, uh, plan a uh, program and and it, it really sort of revealed it, the nuts and bolts of how it was going to do this Th this this announcement came the same day that uh, there was a paper published in some journal that virtual colonoscopy colonoscopy uh, done through the re reconstruction of MRI images I believe it was uh, was as good as the somewhat unpleasant actual colonoscopy and of course, that got on page one of the Washington Post, and the nuts and bolts of three by five uh, got got on the inside. So it's uh, the, there, there's there's a competition um, with what uh, the readers and the editors think is most most relevant to their life, and the countervailing force to that is to show to 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 just reveal the inequities and what can be done with a small amount of uh, of money and effort in 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 other places did you want to add something patty or no i just yeah. found the the access and quality i think it's important to think that at, at least access as you relate to the 44 million people without health care I, I, 
as much as I find that number appalling, I believe we do get the political system that we vote for and that we have to hold our government accountable for what we want and ensure that we work for both the leaders as well as the policies that will deliver health care for all if that's what we believe in. And uh, you know, the other thing is to allow our leaders to really lead. And uh, some of the things we have to do, obviously, are, are get them out of running for office all year and get them into, into leading us um, <coughs> with more of a view towards long-term ancestry. But I mean, I, I think a lot of this does involve uh, educated and active citizenry. And um, while this room is full of people that, that clearly believe that, uh, we are not turning out people who are engaged in our civic decisions at the level that we need to, out of our high schools, out of our uh, colleges. And, you know, we, we it come, a lot of this comes back to government decision making, which is about us. I mean, we think about the coverage of whether that memo was or was not enough information to act on for 911. It's an incredibly important issue, but, you know, the, the same day that the three by five knowledge got out, I mean, nobody talked about the fact that five million new infections each one of those years between now and then. So as little coverage as we got for the need for three by five, we didn't, we missed completely the idea of five million people because of policies and practices and dollars will become infected each of those years between now and, and 2005. So I, I think it's true with media. I mean, we've got to ask for what we want. Um, and it, a lot of that involves uh, citizenry that demands it. And so I know that's somewhat optimistic, uh, but we could do a lot better. And I do think a lot of our leaders will respond if we put this higher on their agenda. David has a comment, and then Sue, I think you wanted to make a comment. Yeah, I, I just want to say that parenthetically, the whole um, question of measurement really adds news value to a lot of these otherwise fairly exactly. am amorphous stories. Uh -huh. the, the, there, there was a... Um, uh, a report done about 10 years ago in which counties were um, uh, rated or um, listed in terms of uh, various health outcomes. Uh, and this, you know, newspapers love charts, they love winners, they love, you know, this is first, this is last. And uh, a reporter went out to um, uh, the, the counties in South Dakota where the Sioux Reservation uh, was and you know did a big story about that. Uh, we, we did stories about what where the uh, Washington suburban counties uh, fit into this so that uh, uh, the, 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 these new metrics or measuring things that weren't previously <coughs> measured um, uh, holds great appeal uh, uh, as news value. Sure. Sue it. Well, just uh, uh, to inform you that uh, a country like Thailand, which is more than 10 times less rich than the U.S., since early 2002, we do not allow any Thai to live without health insurance. We have universal coverage. Mm -hmm. And if you want to know how and why, you come to our uh, discussion tomorrow at the Harvard School of Public Health at 12.30. <laughs> 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 yeah, I, I'd like to ask him a question. Yeah, go ahead. Do, yeah. Do, does the does the <coughs> citizen of Thailand demand that, or is the leadership just that much better? <laughs> oh, this is something that you should come to the yes. <laughs> to <laughs> well, you know. it's a it's a combination of all, you know. But the citizens are expected. Oh, that definitely, their definitely. They, 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 this new government uh, with new party, they are from business, so they did many poll, public poll before the election, and then learn what the p people want. Question up here. Yes. Uh, Ron Morocco, I'm an incoming MCMPA student. Um, I've spent my career in the industry, uh, the medical technology industry, and I'm particularly excited about the panel you have here tonight. My question is uh, whether or not, while at the WHO growth, you have had any experience with industry that has tremendous resources tremendous knowledge, uh, tremendous innovation in pulling uh, some of the assets from industry and sharing them, developing some kind of equity around the world where technology is needed. Uh, any comments on that? Any work in that area? Well, 
I mean, you know, from a um, general uh, political point of view and, and uh, over decades, these kinds of uh, ideas and uh, methods to spread technology came from the discussion also on sustainable development. How do we avoid China adding uh, immensely, you know, this large population to the climate change unless we are willing to be more forthcoming with sharing technologies that can help them move more quickly from the dirty technologies to the cleaner ones. Now, that, that I'm using it as an example. Uh, though these things are very difficult uh, uh, in practice, it, it turns out. But of course, it is happening at some stage because, uh, in fact, now there are improvements in that case and in many other areas. But if you look at the health field directly, environment, of course, is very crucial to health. But if you look at what's happened with uh, development of medical technologies also in ways where uh, you can reach poorer populations in a more effective way, in a simpler way, cost-effectively, those areas have been looked at by research communities and by the WHO and other international institutions and NGOs to try to promote access. And I mean, Gavi, uh, Gates Foundation um, has also been involved in this kind of, of area. There are many activities. But frankly, when you work with industry, most of those industries have their, their bottom line is their profit. And they say so. Uh, so that was, if you go 100 or 150 years back in uh, Europe, uh, it was not totally true, but uh, quite true that that was the thinking. However, as you know, you had employment, uh, employers, uh, and uh, the occupational health. The, the, the terrible poverty that really led the societies not to move forward in any area, gradually this changed. And I'm sure that globally there is a need for private industry to be more forthcoming in being part of the solution. Even if not by law or by force, because this is not easy. There are industries that are now active in the health field uh, at least with their own, you know, their own employees uh, in the AIDS area and others, and they also go into the community around which they serve. Not many, but some industries have the forward-looking idea that they should be part of the solution and that they are sharing both their knowledge and some of their resources uh, to be doing social, uh, socially good work. In a and they increase their own profile, of course, and they have employers who are more happy because their company is a good company that isn't only profit-oriented. We have a question up here. Um, thank you. My name is Pray Chigudere, and I'm Zimbabwean and studying immunology and infectious diseases at the Harvard School of Public Health. Um, I get the impression that you are treating evidence as uh, something that is neutral, is it? Um, and perhaps to take it a step further um, to, to one point that uh, Petty indicated, if, if a senator asks for evidence to show that $2 billion will make a difference, uh, may, uh, are we not justified in asking whether there is evidence to indicate that if we buy drugs using that $2 billion, there won't be a difference? And um, I, I, I am particularly passionate about this, uh, partly because clinical trials are done, proper clinical trials, before any drug is certified for use in humans. If people ask for further evidence before we take drugs to Zimbabwe or Botswana or any other African country, is, is that evidence insufficient? Uh, what kind of evidence do we need? And then I'm afraid accountability may not be in simply collecting data. Anybody want to take up that question it's about the, the quality, the significance of the evidence. Your well, first question, we said mutual, meaning... Neutral. 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 Okay, neutral. Yeah. Well, <laughs> let me take it 
broadly, which is there's a lot of things we don't have answers to. You're right that we can tell you the efficacy of a certain vaccine after it's gone through a certain trial, but you don't, you don't know what will it really cost to deploy it and is the system there to support it? Will it reach the children? Will it only reach some of the children? So often the evidence is about how much will it actually take to take this one bit of product or effort and actually have it reach those you want to reach the most. And then, and specifically, what about doing that versus doing this? The trade-offs with limited resources are a very big part of what we, we need evidence to answer questions that haven't been answered. Will this work? Will it not work? Is it efficacious in, its, in the scientific sense or in the social sense? But then, secondly, is that a better, if I've got a billion or I've got ten dollars, I mean, the, the President of Mozambique tells me you have to make a trade-off every day. Do I set this broken leg or buy that next batch of vaccines? And so part of the evidence is, uh, frankly, for cost-effectiveness of the trade-offs that need to be made. You know, when we're talking about dozens of dollars per capita spent only on health, then there's going to be trade-offs within that for donors as well. And it, the, the most stressful trade-off is made at the actual point of health care, that, that's my experience, is that the, the real accountability is do I, how far can I go to treat this person? So I, I think a lot of evidence is about comparative uh, decision making. You, you know that from a personal level. Yeah. You want to say something? Well, uh, just very briefly, but that sometimes you use the evidence uh, based on your interest. It's not uh, neutral. Very, very good evidence is that you, many people sub promote a lot uh, biomedical care for HIV AIDS or prevention, biomedical prevention for HIV AIDS, like vaccine. You know, you invest a lot on uh, trying to get a new vaccine for HIV AIDS. Why there are so many vaccines around, but you never promote to use it, or you, 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 don't, you do not want to promote to use it? 100% condom among commercial sex workers. This is a very good and effective vaccine with no intellectual properties attached to it and very cheap. But it doesn't have a strong advo advocacy to use it. Well, it has opponents, right? I mean, the <laughs> issues of using condoms uh, turns out to be uh, incredibly vexed and complicated. And so what's really interesting is there's often a collision of public health values that we may take for granted with, with other kinds of values. No doubt about that. One of the uh, profound lessons I learned in Washington is that science does not equal uh, public policy decisions. <laughs> you had a question. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Sarah Legrand. I'm an undergraduate here. My question was about the sort of trade-offs inherent in the kind of accountability mechanisms that you impose on sort of donor assistance in very resource poor settings. Um, I was in Malawi last year, which as I'm sure you know is a country that's overwhelmingly de dependent on donor assistance. And it was my experience in a lot of the projects that I visited that there were some forms of donor assistance from organizations like the Global Fund that had such stringent requirements for accountability that everyone in you know, the ministry or the department or the organization was so busy accounting for the Global Fund money that was earmarked for treatment in this case that they weren't able to fulfill the ministerial or institutional priorities in you know, primary care or primary prevention or reproductive health care. So I wonder if you could comment on that. Well, if you talk about Global Fund, uh, this is something, some kind of social innovation that uh, we try to cut down all the unnecessary bureaucracy, unnecessary report. But there are still report and bureaucracy there. In addition to the possibility of country like Malawi to implement what they have got. Malawi is the first, is the, the country that has the highest fund from global fund, almost 300 million US dollar, biggest. But WR to Malawi just told me that they are losing 20 to 30 nurses a month to UK. Yes, yes. And this is, this is the situation. And we are going to see, I, I just really want to see what, what, is, what will be the achievement in addition to these bureaucratic you know, difficulties that you have. And it happened everywhere. 
Thank you, sir. David has a comment. Yeah, I, I think the, the, the press plays a very small role in what is sometimes hyper accountability, and, and that is the, 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 the um, there's very high news value for people wasting money, people mm -hmm. doing the wrong thing, yeah. you know, the gotcha story. Right. And uh, I have some sense that the Global Fund um, realized that it was only one scandal from basically uh, having its, its uh, being killed in the crib, basically. And um, that, that one scandal would undoubtedly be delivered to the, to the world public through the, uh, through the press. And uh, sort of the worse it was, and if you, you know, the, the better, you know, for news value. Uh, and it's very possible, as you all know, I, I don't need to tell you, to, to make things appear worse than they actually are, even if they're not terribly good to begin with. In other words, uh, um, uh, malfeasance or th mistakes can be turned into malfeasance uh, with uh, proper editing or proper right. writing. Exactly. <laughs> so, so that um, uh, I, I, th I think that, that, that we, we share uh, some responsibility for the fact that people are spending all their time accounting and not enough time treating. Now, I promised to go around in a circle, but social justice requires that I recognize that you've been standing there for the longest Thank time. You. So. Um, I'm Aratu Castro, um, in the faculty at Harvard Medical School, and I'm also at Partners in Health. And I'm, I think it's really exciting that uh, Harvard is launching the Global Health Initiative, and that because it can have a very important impact in, we hope, in the world. And uh, my question is, given that we're talking about accountability and measurement and evidence, are we as an institution going to be somehow accountable to not only train more professionals in global health, which is absolutely needed, but to making sure that the initiative is going to have an impact in alleviating the suffering in, in, the, poor, in the poor world. And then you so that's, that. that's what I have to answer. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I mean, the mission of the university is to create new knowledge and to educate the next generation and disseminate that knowledge. And uh, we have a lot of priorities we can select from. But I think there's a very broad consensus at the university, not just mine or President Summers, uh, but there's a broad consensus that global health is an area where Harvard can make an enormous difference, precisely because this is the kind of topic that brings to bear all of our skills, development of new technologies, both biomedical and potentially devices and engineering, where we can address uh, some of the cultural barriers to the dissemination of these innovations, which range from healthcare delivery issues to, uh, again, if you've been reading the news recently about polio eradication, beliefs in northern Nigeria that the uh, polio vaccine is not actually beneficial, but something that will sterilize minority children. Uh, to issues of proper governance, to issues of healthcare economics. So we believe that this is a place where Harvard can have an enormous impact intellectually and that that information will benefit um, those people who are actually engaged in the practice. But more than that, we think, whether we're accountable or not, we believe that Harvard has a role not just as an American university, but as a global university. Uh, and this is a, a critical way in which we can, within our, the bounds of our mission, uh, reach out and uh, connect in a very effective way uh, globally to the benefit, um, hopefully, of the world, but also of, uh, of our students. Next can question. Can I add something? Oh, yeah, you can. For, uh, for yes. Harvard? Yeah. Uh, Although you were going to save I, I it think, later. I yeah. think what you mentioned about Harvard is, is what Harvard can do according to, to the, the intellectual capital you have. But you haven't used the social capital you have. I would like to see that in the next five years, Harvard produced for the world 10,000 uh, Paul Farmer. I'm sure you can do well. with your social capital. You don't have to educate them here. But with the name of Harvard, yep. 
you may create certain special recognition for doctors who work in the underprivileged area around the world. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you have it yes. in, in, in every country. In our country, one of our most prestigious and oldest medical school create a best rural doctor award since 30 years ago. And every year, one rural doctor will be invited to the medical school, oldest and prestigious, most pre prestigious medi medical school like Harvard. And he'll give a keynote address, speak whatever he wants to inspire the faculty member and the student about his work. And this has been in the, in the, in the media, uh, catch the, the, the coverage of the media. And this is an inspiration to, 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 to the, the whole new graduates. I'm one of the, the, those who are inspired by this. Well, you're absolutely right. And of course, we're incredibly proud of not only Paul Farmer, but other members of our faculty who uh, work in developing world settings, often against all odds, to do, to do good. And uh, in fact, we're very proud that one of our hospitals, because the, the actual practice part is carried forth by our affiliated hospitals, Brigham and Women's Hospital has just launched a global health residency where uh, some of the, it's the most, among the most competitive programs for young physicians once they've graduated from medical school to enter to get into the Brigham and Women's and they will do a training partly in the United States and partly at sites abroad. Um, and I think we're seeing uh, the beginnings of what I hope will be uh, a movement of the kind that uh, I hope you'll be able to approve of in a few years. <laughs> Question over here. My name is Wanja Njiguna and I'm a journalist from Kenya, but I'm also a student here. And I hope I won't disappoint him when I tell him maybe in the next five years I'll be a female, maybe Paul Farmers from uh, Kennedy School. So let's, let's wait and see. My interest is um, HIV AIDS and uh, I had occasion to ask Paddy this question earlier. So Paddy, you are off the hook. So I, I'd like to hear this from other people. And uh, for me, it's accountability. I get very excited when we, when we are sent money uh, back home in Africa. I come from Kenya where we lose between 500 and 700 people to HIV AIDS every day. And we, we are excited about the money, we are excited about the drugs. But the issue of accountability comes back because I was telling her, unless you send, uh, we, have the, we have policy issues, we have infrastructure issues, and when you send us when this money comes to, the, to maybe to a lot of countries, we are glad it comes. But unless someone like follows up to see that this money, these drugs are getting to the right people, we, we are not getting anywhere. I read the other day in my own country, in Nairobi, antiretrovirals are being sold on the streets. Yes. Anybody accessing those drugs, you know what, what the process of, you know. This of is an extremely important issue. We have only, I, I'd like to get to at least one more question. So let me ask if, if, yeah. I, if I might, if any of the panelists want to respond, because I think this, this gets right to the heart of the issue of accountability. It gets to the question about Malawi, about why there was so much oversight. Uh, anybody have a view? Well, well okay. unless you have a well-functioning yeah, uh, drug control, rec drug regulatory authorities, you face that situation. Did you want to say something? No, I'm just saying, you know, you're describing uh, that Kenya is a poor country with a lot of problems, including corruption, including uh, not always good governance at all levels, and you're not alone in that situation. And that people who are trying from different angles and perspectives to help Kenya and the Kenyan people uh, have a struggle, and, and I'm talking about those who try to do something, uh, not about what I think that many who are not doing enough should be doing more, which is why <laughs> we have the problem that there are the great gaps between uh, what should be done and what is in fact done not to lose too much time and not to lose too many lives while the rich world is sitting too still and not doing what it should be doing. So you are in the middle of that in your question. It's 629, so you get the last word. And I apologize to those of you who didn't get to uh, ask a question. 
Thanks. This is, my name is Michael Yogman. I'm on the pediatric faculty at the medical school. And my question is about the accountability of the food industry. It's certainly an area that has enormous implications for global health in terms of obesity, malnutrition, and even the issue of agricultural subsidies. Are there strategies, I know, Ro, you mentioned, uh, brought this up about a month ago here, strategies to try to have an impact on uh, making the food industry more socially responsive that uh, is certainly compatible even with their bottom line? You know, now uh, in the World Health Assembly, they will be dealing uh, with a document uh, that, that was worked on on the um, executive board in January. And uh, there were differences of opinion with, between countries on the WHO executive board about the content and about how far the resolution should go. And uh, I'm uh, curious about what happens in the health assembly. I'm hopeful that uh, they will be able to have a progressive policy and to start taking seriously that you can start discussing whether the content of salt the, the uh, d description that <coughs> consumers get, you know, about the products they buy, that there are certain standards that need to be developed to avoid and to counter the, the epidemics of obesity, cardiovascular disease, and et cetera. And, uh, you know, you have to take this seriously at the national level and at the intergovernmental level, which is the WHO, trying to serve all countries and humanity on these issues. But they are certainly difficult, and uh, I understand that uh, there was a tough discussion uh, in the executive board in, uh, in January, and frankly, and this is interesting, I will, we can talk about it afterwards, mm -hmm. I think on the sugar side, mm -hmm. uh, it seemed a year ago when I, or nine months ago when I left WHO, that there was an understanding uh, in many countries about the seriousness of, of what's happening. On the other hand, the sugar lobby here in this country, mm. we're making resolutions with, you know, sending letters to me which were absolutely uh, crazy. And, you know, I could uh, kind of make them accountable for saying stupid things. Uh, however, I know that after that, there has been a mobilization of many developing countries who are afraid of their sugar crops. Mm. And, it rem and, and they come behind the US or others who are very careful on this issue. And I worry because it looks a little like what we saw for many years in the tobacco mm. situation. That you know the analysis mm. of what is long term is important for the people of all countries, including the developing ones. Because they don't, people in developing countries don't need to have wrong nutrition. Many of them have undernutrition, and that needs to be corrected. But unless they have the right nutrition, how are we going to overcome the consequences with regard to the health indicators? Can I add a bit? Yes, you, you can. Uh, because I'm in the middle of this discussion. Oh, good. Uh, last year, Thailand chaired the G77 at the World Health Assembly, and I represent my country. I was pushed so hard to bring this issue, to, to brought this issue up to discuss within the G77 through diplomatic means. But, you know, uh, I, I was too busy, you know, and it's not in the agenda of the World Health, uh, World Health Assembly, but this year it's there. And I can assure you that the sugar industry worked very hard and put very strong pressure to, I think, most of the delegates from developing countries to ban the technical report series of, of the WHO and join the WHO and FAO, which uh, suggests the, that the energy intake of, of human beings in energy intake, daily energy intake, should not uh, come from free sugar more than 10 percent. And, and this is from the sugar council. And if you go to look at the member of the sugar council, you, under, you understand who is behind this. And they're moving very, very heavily around the world. So if you are going to, to uh, hold them accountable for that, uh, 
uh, I, I, I told you before, you will be in diffi big difficulties. Mm -hmm. But if you do not fight, you, you face something uh, very difficult as well. If you go to Bangkok and you travel on the, on the, the tollway from, from the airport into the city, there's a big sign now, uh, uh, advertisement with a spoon and the sugar pour on the spoon. Uh, have you taken any sugar today? Uh, take sugar help the economy of the farmer. Mm -hmm. Sugar association. Mm. Oh my goodness. Yeah. On that note, <laughs> <laughs> let me thank the panelists for a really interesting discussion and thank the audience for great questions. <laughs>